All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, this is the Society of Thoracic Surgeons Adult Cardiac Surgery Database webinar, monthly webinar for November. It's November 1st, 2023. On the line with me today, we have, oh, somebody's raising their hand. We have Catherine Holyfield, Leanne Jones, Addie Dolan, Emily Conrad, and Melinda from STS, and Melinda's our consultant. Uh, going forward, I'll be handing some of my STS responsibilities over to Catherine. Catherine Holyfield um, is over our Intermax database now, and Catherine, would you like to say a few words as you get to meet this awesome group? Yeah, I'm excited. I've heard, I've heard for a long time how awesome this group is, so... <laughs> Can't wait to um, to work with y'all more often. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. Um, I'll still be around. Catherine and I and Melinda will be tag teaming adult cardiac, and Catherine will be taking on uh, more of the responsibilities. But we'll, we'll all still be working together. Um, okay. And then STS updates. I'll go through those and risk factor education. Melinda has provided many many slides on PAD, unresponsive state, syncope, and pre-op labs, and we'll be having polling questions. Um, we'll be having polling questions uh, with these, so make sure you get your polling fingers ready. November training manual was posted. Harvest four closes on November tenth. I realize that's Observed Veterans Day. We will be, be not moving the date for Observed Veterans Day. Please try to get your data in early. And I apologize for the oversight on my part for scheduling it then. Um, but we are not able to move the harvest close date. AQO Hot Topics webinar will be coming in early December. Uh, I have a date picked out, but I'm just going to need to work on confirmation from the speakers before we send up um, formal communication to, to AQO attendees. Um, just the timeline. I know you all like this timeline. So November 1st is here. November 10th, Harvest 4 closes. 14th is opt-out for November for Harvest 4. Remember, um, get your data in by November 10th. But if for some reason um, you, know, you do not want to be included in analysis, you got partial data in, but you weren't, weren't able to get all your data in and cleaned up or um, for whatever reason, and you want to remove your site's data from Harvest for analysis only, you'll need to fill out that opt-out form on the IQVIA website under the resource library. November, Wednesday, November 15th at 2 p.m. Central, we will have our next quality improvement series webinar. I have a speaker, Mark Perdome, will be presenting to us along with his, uh, his team in CT surgery and their project that they've instituted at their community hospital which has been extremely successful. Um, I read the abstract that was submitted to a, a recent meeting. It's uh, phenomenal, and they're looking forward to sharing with uh, sharing that all with you. We're super excited to have them um, on November fifteenth. So if you are available, or if um, the folks on your team that typically are joining these QI webinars are available, please let them know um, that this is happening. Um, like I said, the post AQO Hot Topics webinar will be early December. Date will be announced soon. December 6th is our non next monthly webinar at 2 p.m. Central. This will be the um, uh, presentation on the beta blocker project, which was presented in October's monthly webinar. We have a near final data collection form, which will be reviewed this week by our uh, surgeon leaders, our physician leaders. We plan to send formal notification out to sites in mid-November. I'm working on that now. And then we will have this webinar in December. The information, uh, we will also be working with warehousing with the vendors. Um, some vendors had reached out to us that were interested in building this form into their software. I'm free for sites, I believe, is what they told me. So, uh, which is really wonderful that they're even um, offering to do this, that they're willing to help out. So we're we're planning to have a call with the vendors that has yet to be scheduled, but we're looking for the next couple of weeks to um, have data specifications finalized, a, tr a training manual supplement, which Melinda is working on, and the data collection form uh, to be available for a vendor call sometime in mid-November. Um, to discuss this with them and give them the opportunity to make that decision if they if they would like to build it or not. Otherwise, sites would be 
uh, having to use the red cap form. Again, this is a voluntary project and uh, more information to come out via email in a few weeks. And then January 1st is the beta blocker project go live. So that's the OR date that we'll start collecting this information. On. Um, here is the harvest 2023 dates. And uh, we're at harvest four, closes on November 10th, opt out is November 14th, and this will include procedures through December 30th. We should uh, expect that report sometime, usually in De uh, late to, or in mid January. We have a couple blackout dates in December that we avoid uh, during the holidays, and then um, we usually try to get that out uh, mid, mid January for reporting out to sites. And okay, everybody pay attention. If you're listening and you're not watching, you're going to ask me to go back to this slide that's coming up next. So uh, focus on your computer screen, everybody. Here are the 2024 dates for harvest. So we have, and that was kind of to be funny, uh, harvest one 2024 will close um, February 23rd, harvest two May 24th, harvest three August 23rd, and harvest four November 22nd. We tried to, um, we tried to, when I picked these dates, I tried to be um, appreciative of all the comments I received throughout uh, the years in picking dates. So hopefully these are a little bit better than what they had been in the past and hopefully they work for everybody. Um, so there you go. This is not yet posted on the STS website. It will be posted soon. So um, please, you know, pay attention to that, but I will, we will continue, Catherine and I will continue to include these in the slide, monthly slides going forward. Okay, does everybody, everybody get their screenshot of that? Okay, all right, I'm moving on. Okay, now uh, we're gonna hand it over to Melinda for the monthly education. I'm glad you guys have such a great sense of humor, by the way. It really makes this job a lot fun, a lot more fun or a lot funner. I don't know if funner is a word or not. Is it Melinda? It's it's a word in the South, I think. Yeah, I think it finally made its way into Mary. We used to Latin say it in the South too. I think funner is a word. I think it's in the dictionary. So, so you have the dictionary at least. Yeah. Well, I'm not Southern, but I do live South of Interstate 80, like a block. So that is considered, up here, it is considered the South. So do you want to answer some of these general questions before I get started? Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, Mary is asking if there's any way they could get a list of data managers for each facility. Unfortunately, Mary, we don't share that information. Um, we don't share that information. If there is something you want out, us to mail out on your behalf, um, we can certainly consider that. I think Emily, um, Emily and I have handled those types of requests in the past. Past, so feel free to send us your request in email. Um, to and thanks, Leanne turned off the chat, but um, feel, Leanne will put in Emily and mine's email address in the chat box for you, so you can send it, um, send your request to us, and we can communicate with you if it's something we can help with or not. Um, does everyone get an invite into the beta blocker project or do we have to sign up? Nope, everybody's invited. It's a voluntary project. And um, we just ask that if you are able to participate that you're, um, you send in us all your cases. So we have a complete picture of what's happening at your site for all the cases. And it, it's nothing, uh, it's just that we want to better understand the beta blocker administration preoperatively and then the treatment and rate of post AFib com compared to that uh, to have a better understanding. Is the report or tool for inclusion to restart receive STAR reports and risk analysis available in, res in resources in IQ via any ETA? <clears throat> so that report, um, what the report we're talking about is the what we call the executive summary. It's going to have your STAR ratings, uh, longitudinal STAR ratings over um, the last six star rating analysis, so last two years, harvest one and three for the last two, uh, three years, I'm sorry. And then it'll have some uh, high level, um, some high level results for your post-operative events like ICU length of stay, total length of stay, blood usage. Just right now, it's just focused on isolated cabbage for that section. And then the other part of that report is if your data is um, 
going to be accepted into the harvest or not. We were hoping to have it out for harvest four, which closes on November 10th. I think we're starting user acceptance testing on that next week. It does not look like it's going to be out um, by November 4th or by November 10th for the close of harvest four, but it'll be close. Um, I'll give you some more updates on that. And I, if we get through these slides, I might even be able to show you a uh, preview of that. And it's um, what's going into user acceptance testing from a call we had with IQBO earlier this week, just to give you an idea of what, what that report will look like. It will be coming out soon. Um, it's going to be close to the close of harvest for though. Where can we get more information on the beta blocker project? Um, so Kathy, thanks for the question. We did a, a webinar on October 1st on the Beta Blocker Project. I would start there. That is posted on the on our YouTube channel and also on the STS website under webinars for adult cardiac. Uh, I will be sending, we will be sending an email from STS in mid-November, and then we will have another webinar uh, focused on Beta Blocker Project on December 6th, which is the monthly ACSD webinar. You're welcome, Lisa, on updating the due dates. Um, the November closure date is a hardship for those of us with volume increasing and doing more with less, less ethos than many hospitals are working under. I hear you, Cindy, and um, we have to stick to that date right now just because of other deadlines and blackout dates. We tried to make it later for next year. Um, but this year, because we have so many different reports coming out and updates coming out, um, we're not able to move that date. So we're stuck with November 10th for uh, for Harvest for Just try to do your best to get your data in. Um, and we, we try to do better for next year. Uh, no, Carol, my apologies. Did I miss that you're leaving STS or taking on other STS duties? No, I'm here. I just need some help with adult cardiac. So Catherine from Intermax. Uh, we'll be coming over to the adult side to take on some of those responsibilities. Um, is my my responsibilities at STS have, have evolved a little bit, um, pulling me away from all of the all of the adult um, things. So I have to focus on a couple other areas. Uh, so we're pulling in Catherine um, from Intermax to help with the adult side. So we're happy to have her and uh, her clinical expertise in Intermax and as a cardiac nurse will be wonderful. Uh, for you all. And of course, we will always have Melinda. Yeah. When is Thanksgiving 2024? That's a good question. It is the 28th of November, right? I yeah, think we looked, correct. We looked yeah. at that. We, we yeah. looked at that, Carol, when we made those. Yeah. I thought so. It is the 28th of November that year. So you, um, we close on the Friday before Thanksgiving. And we, we struggled with this because, you know, if I go out of town for Thanksgiving, sometimes I go out the whole week before and I might not want to work on this, but hopefully, um, hopefully folks will have their data in through September 30th by this date, and it won't be an issue for those traveling. Yeah, you're welcome, Mary. Um, we can, if you're looking for Mary saying thank you, she, Mary's, Mary asked for the contacts at other facilities. If you have a facility where you know your patient was transferred to, um, you know, just reach out to me or Emily and we can see if there's some way that we could help you. That is one of the greatest benefits of going to AQO Live. Yep. Um, what is the red? I think they're talking about red cap, Carol. Oh, red cap. Did I say red cap? I think. Red cap is where we'll be collecting the beta blocker um, data. Oh, when I was talking about vendors. So you'll have an option to submit that directly into a red cap form, which is a link we'll provide to you. It's a um, supplemental data collection that we will end up linking back at STS. It only is going to collect um, de identified variables and then some additional information on beta blocker administration. Um, some of the vendors have offered to look into building that for sites that are their customers. Uh, so we're gonna have a call with them to talk more about that. We'll provide more information on the beta blocker project and the December 6th webinar. Do you have an estimate for when the vendors will get the updated risk model coefficients used in the new risk calculator so they can update their system? Uh, good question, Ala. So right now we have a few, like I said, um, regarding like harvest close dates and things, we have a, 
many other pending projects in adult cardiac right now. We have a multi-valve model coming out, a, a multi-procedural model coming out. We have updates to coefficients that are um, happening in analytics right now, but we have to work with vendors. So, and then we have these red cap forms that are coming out, or red cap form for adult cardiac that's coming out. Um, all of these are things that the vendors are aware of and also they're aware of and they they are um, aware that they need to be implementing you know new risk models within their software, these updated coefficients, et cetera. We have to recertify, we'll have to you know work out a certification process with them for building these new risk models. We didn't want to have to cause the vendors uh, double work or triple work by doing, you know, asking them to do things in increments for as, as new projects come out. So we're looking to update, to make a long story short, we're looking to have the vendors update these coefficients sometime in early 2024, once we have the model specifications for um, the two new risk models, the multi-valve and multi-procedural model. Those were discussed at the, and at the um, AQO meeting and um, more information will be provided as we get ready to go live with those. So I hope that helps. Have you have you sent any information to the surgeons about the beta blocker? So for be the beta blocker project, we will be sending out formal communication in mid-November to surgeons, um, data managers, primary and backup anesthesiologists that participate in the database, and then um, our Society for Cardiovascular or Cardiothoracic Anesthesiologists will also be notifying their anesthesiologists about this project. Have you sent, oh, that was done. If we participate in the beta blocker project, will we be able to get a report specific to our individual hospitals? We haven't worked all of the details out on that yet, Sharon, but we will be able to provide site specific reports back to the hospitals that request it. And we just don't have the whole process worked out yet. Oh, regarding, thank you, Nancy. Yeah, we're not, so it's, um, Nancy's clarifying Mary's question about sometimes needing to communicate with data managers at other hospitals when patients are transferred to their facilities. It would be helpful to be able to contact the data manager directly to get mortality status, et cetera. Is there someone at STS we can contact to connect us with that person if needed? Um, I'm very hesitant to say, call me anytime you have a transfer and I'll be happy to connect you um, because that's not, um, you really need to put steps in place at your hospital to um, secure that information outside of you having to contact the data manager at that hospital. If that is absolutely the last resort and you've utilized or have exhausted all your other resources and you seriously cannot get in contact with somebody, um, Emily and I, and I'm putting Emily in here, but I, I, Emily and I and Catherine, we can help you connect. Um, but we don't have the bandwidth to be connecting everybody with all of the transferred patients hosp uh, receiving hospital. So um, please keep that in mind. We're happy to help you, but our resources are limited. So um, please make sure that it, you really exhausted all your resources before reaching out to us and we can try to help you if, if needed. To participate in the beta blocker project, where can I find the red cap site? So that's more information will be coming in um, a formal communication mid-November. And we will have that link ready uh, probably for the December webinar. We'll do a live demo of the red cap form and it will go live. Um, it, it will not be expecting to have cases submitted until um, OR date start, starting with January 1st. Yeah, thank you for giving a consideration on the 2024 harvest due dates. This year was really tough. We, we, we were and are still scrambling for next week's deadline. Thanks, Golda, for that feedback and sorry it was a hard year. We should just add it to what we have to work with now. I hear you, Beth. Any updates on the in-person AQO for next year? Um, none, none that I can give, Kelly. We are uh, still waiting for our contracts teams on both sides to finish signing the contract before we can uh, release the release the site information to you all. 
tra uh, regarding transfer, Sherry's saying she has medical record department getting the records and scanning it in. And I think that's a great, um, I think that is a great way to, uh, a great tool to have in your back pocket to work with your medical records department. Um, sometimes they even know people at the other hospitals and they're able to, to do that, especially if they have lots of transfers between two hospitals. It's a common thing if it's a specifically a community and a um, academic center, and they usually know people over there. Um, yeah, and that's right, Nancy, this is a last resort situation. Absolutely. But happy to help, but please uh, be mindful. Is this the same website? Red cap site we use for valves. It will be a different link, but yes, it is the same platform, red cap platform. Medical records is the best for audit, but it's painful to wait for sometimes. Yeah, I hear you, Beth. All right, Melinda, I did my work for the day. I'm all done. I'm signing out. Okay, well, sometimes it's best to get those questions out of the way before we start going we into. Have, um, we do have two hand raised. I have a, a Donna and a Diana with their hand raised. So, um, what do you want to do those real fast? Yeah, yeah. they want to talk. Just raise your hand to test me. I see you too. Or do you really have? I'm going to uh, allow Diana to talk. If you go ahead, Diana, if you're able. And then EA2 raise there. Oh, put your hand. Raise it up. Put it down. Hand raise and error. No problem, Donna. Um, Diana and EA21342. Mysterious. Uh, Shwan, if you could email me with your situation, I could provide, Catherine and I can provide some guidance on that. Okay, I don't think anybody wants to talk to us, Melinda, so you can go ahead. Okay, so they're, they're forced to listen to me now. <laughs> yeah. All right, just, I just, there we go, get back to my slides. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, this is actually um, the last of the risk factor section, so the next time I do education, we'll, we'll be moving into another um, section of the training manual. Today, we're going to talk about PAD, unresponsive state, syncope, and pre-op labs. Next slide. So as you can see, um, PAD, unresponsive state, syncope, hematocrit, white blood cell, platelet, and creatinine are all in the risk model. And in 2000, and they are also audit fields in 2023. So for the current audit, these are audit fields. Next slide. So we're gonna go in and just do like we normally do every, when I do education, we're gonna have a question and then we're gonna have an audience response and then we're going to talk about the answer. So the question number one, patient has documented subclavian artery stenosis. How do you code PAD? A okay. is yes, B is no. All right, Catherine is taking a stab at the polling question, so be patient as she gets that. There yeah. you go. Good job, Catherine Strong. There we go. Woo -woo. Woo. I knew you'd get it. <laughs> it's not over yet. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Melinda, were you expecting this split? Uh, sort of. Sort of. Option A is certainly in the lead. Mm -hmm. Don't be giving away the answer, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got nice attendance today as uh, everybody goes through to answer the polling question. And we know if you're looking in your training manual. So don't be checking your training manual for this answer. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, we have a nice attendance today. We have 424 people on with us. It's one of our larger ones. A lot. I think we could probably stop it. We've been at 70, 30 for, for quite some time now. Let's do it. And so the answer to this question is. Oh, that's my job. <laughs> is yes. <laughs> Worry about Catherine and I, I'm not doing my job. So, so when you look at the definition for PAD, it includes upper and lower extremity renal, mesenteric, and abdominal aortic systems. It can include, and you'll see down there in red, documented subclavian artery stenosis. It also includes claudication, either at rest or exertion, amputation for arterial vascular insufficiency, 
vascular reconstruction, vascular bypass, um, although this excludes, you know, dialysis, fistulas, and vein stripping. And it can include a documented abdominal aortic aneurysm with or without repair. Okay, question number two. Next slide. H&P documents a history of Raynard's disease. How do you code PAD? A is yes, B is no. Oh, you have to relaunch this again. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. There we go. Ah, fast fingers on this one. Mm -hmm. Look at that. Fast fingers. You can't stop them, Melinda. <laughs> Okay. You ready to stop it? End it. Probably yeah. so. It's pretty good. It's evident yeah. that most people know the answer to this question. And the answer is no. Um, PAD does not include DVT, pulmonary artery aneurysm, Raynard's disease, AVM, or Thurner syndrome, or Berger's syndrome. Um, so glad everybody got the answer to that. Almost everybody did. That was, that was good. Question number three, pre-op CT scan showed a 60% stenosis in the iliac artery. I do not see any documentation of PAD diagnosis by the provider in the medical record. How do I code PAD? Do I say no or do I say yes? This one's a little PAD, trickier. Yeah, the poll's running option A or option B. These PAD questions always got me it when I was abstracting. I always had to refer to the training manual for these. Mm, that was split. This one's close. Yeah, I knew this one's going to be a split because this is a this is a tricky one. Um, because some of the language some of the language changed between versions. So. Um, so we've got about a 50-50 split, which is what I actually expected. So let's see what the actual answer is to this question. So the answer is no. Now, why is the answer no? Because when we went to version 4.2, we have some specific language about how data managers are not expected to interpret diagnostic results. And they should review the chart for other documentation of PAD to confirm a diagnosis. So although you have um, a pre-op CT scan that showed a 60% stenosis in the iliac artery, which is a probable indicator of PAD, you don't have any documentation of a diagnosis in this medical record by a provider. So, so when it's the word probable there was the key, right? The word possible here is the key to that. Well, the, the key is that we're not expecting the data manager to look at that pre-op CT scan and say, oh, they've got a 60% stenosis so that in that iliac artery, so they have PAD. Yeah, That's this, the key. That's the yeah. key. The first part of it, though, where it says greater than 50% diameter stenosis is a possible indicator of PAD. Mm -hmm. And then it further says you have to have documentation that of the PAD. And we don't want you to, we don't want data managers to try to have to figure out if it is uh, diseased or not. It's yes, that 50%, that sentence or paragraph with the 50% is more for educational purposes only. And I think, so Melinda, in this instance, what would you do if you saw a pre-op CT scan of 60%, but you didn't see any diagnosis of PAD? Would you just code it as no, or would you question it? Would you question? I would. It? I would ask the provider to clarify it because, like I said, in my mind, I would think, oh, that probably is PAD. Maybe he just missed it, and maybe I'd like to have that risk factor on coded for this patient. So I would clarify it. Yeah, I would too because it, PAD is used in the risk factors or in the risk model, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So I wouldn't want to um, just 
throw the possibility of this risk factor away on my decalculating my expected rates. I would want to make sure that I was very, very sure that this was absolutely not disease right. uh, before coding it as no. And I see Beth's hand flew up when we when we showed the mm -hmm. answer to this one. So I don't know if Beth has something she wants to add or not. Yeah, go ahead, Beth. I was just going to say, if we're looking at the um, the CT results, that is being read by a physician who is determining. I mean, that's no different than me looking at the carotid ultrasound to determine whether or not they have 50 percent, 70 percent, 80 percent, 100 percent blocked. There's no difference in either one of those things. I'm doing it in both of those types of tests. So I don't understand how come I can't count this 60% as uh, peripheral artery disease if it's clearly annotated by a radiologist who is also a physician. Because when you look at the data definition, it doesn't say that you can determine that it's PAD based on a level of stenosis like you can in, in the carotid, for example. And like we do for our for your cast too, right? So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, it just seems like we're saying yeah. we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. Is kind of what it feels like to me. Right. I just want to make sure that I understand this is what what we're going to do moving forward. I'm not going to go back and change things, but I will. I think this was in place at the start of version four point two. It was at the place at the start of version four, um, and it, it has to do with how the definition is defined and what's included in the definition. And we don't have a percent of stenosis to determine PAD in this particular definition like we do for carotid stenosis or coronary artery stenosis. Um, so mm -hmm. I think that that's the key and the, the, probably the key learning point from this example, which I knew would, would raise some issues and perhaps cause some controversy. Yeah, and this was a big discussion when we were doing the training manual for 4.2. It was a big discussion with the surgeons, and I think it originated, if I'm correct, Melinda, didn't originate from an FAQ that came in for version 2.9. And yeah, it was, I, th I thought so. And it was, um, I think, it, I can't remember the full discussion with the surgeon. But we felt that this, you know, a, showing a greater than 50% diameter in stenosis is a possible indicator of PAD. It's not a definite indicator, even though, you know, some physicians or um, nurses may consider that diseased. It is a possible indicator, but we need to have a physician saying that the patient has PAD. Now, Melinda, on that CT scan, if it showed a 60% stenosis in the iliac artery, and then the radiologist continued to say, uh, patient has PAD. Would that that's be different? Would yeah, that be that's acceptable? Different. Yeah, yeah, because that's you what, have you have the stenosis being associated with a diagnosis of PAD. Right. So it's a different, different scenario that that makes it different. You've got documentation in that case. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, we got more raised hands. It looks like. Okay. Uh, thanks, Beth. Let me see, uh, Kelly, oops, go ahead. And I have um, Diana, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say that last point you made is how I interpret it. If a doctor adds an impression in any exam, I take it. But if I were to just see it like this, I, I don't, I wouldn't take it. Yeah, that's right. That's what we're that's what we were getting at. It's, there has to be something either by the radiologist, the cardiologist, the surgeon, where there's um there's their interpretation of what the stenosis means. Right. It's not our job to interpret what this means for for PAD. It's their job to interpret it for us. Um, because maybe something else is going on. I don't know, or maybe it's the test was a, you know, maybe they didn't get good pictures of it or whatever it may be, whatever their um, their knowledge is on this, they, it's their responsibility to indicate if that is PAD and then where to take that information. 
Okay. Yeah, thank well, you. That one certainly sparked a lot of, I'm so glad. I'm actually glad that it sparked some uh, con yeah. conversation. So it helps clarify things for people. Okay, let's see if question number four causes as much controversy. I don't, I don't think it will. <laughs> okay, provider documents PAD due to carotid disease. Patient has a relatively long history of PAD, status post a left carotid endarterectomy. How do you code PAD? A is yes, B is no. Oh boy. <laughs> Well, about 60, 40. Well, 65, 35. This one is a little tricky. Okay, so option B got 65% of the um, answers. So let's see what happens. And the answer is no. Okay, so why is the answer no? Even though you have the doctor documenting PAD, he's saying it's due to carotid disease. And a lot of providers do that, okay? So that's why I'm bringing this up. Peripheral arterial disease excludes disease in the carotid, cerebral vascular or thoracic aorta in our definition because we have a separate field to um, capture the carotid disease and cerebrovascular artery disease, okay? We don't capture thoracic aorta anymore. We used to a long time ago, but. So this patient's prior history was of a left carotid endarterectomy. So that patient's disease will be captured in sequence 525, which is cerebrovascular disease, instead of sequence 505, which is PAD, because the PAD that the physician was talking about was in the carotid system. Okay. Yeah, and there's a question. We can get to the questions after. I don't want to. Okay. Okay. Next. Question number five. Is a femoral pseudoaneurysm requiring surgical repair after a heart cath considered PAD? A is yes, B is no. I better speed up. We've got 20 minutes left. <laughs> That's a pretty good split. We got to kind of speed up. So 90, 90, over 90% 90 of the people have chose the answer no. And that is the correct answer. Uh, the pseudoaneurysm was actually caused by the calf procedure. It's not intrinsic arterial disease that we're looking for um, in this sequence number. Okay. Question number five, uh, number six. So we're, we're moving into a different section now into unresponsive section. Um, patient had a cardiac arrest within 24 hours of surgery and was unresponsive. The patient was resuscitated and able to open their eyes and follow commands prior to surgery. Do I code this as unresponsive state? Yes or no? Good questions, Melinda. Thank you. These are all questions that came into the FAQ mailbox? Most of them do come in, yeah. So this is, okay, so this is like a 75-25 split. Let's see what the answer to this is. So the answer is no. Okay, so when we look at this definition, we're talking about a patient that has a history of a non-medically induced unresponsive state within 24 hours of surgery. Code yes, if the patient never regained consciousness prior to surgery, but, but also if they're not induced by some medication too, they can't be like on um, sedatives and be unresponsive. Temporary loss of consciousness that resolved after cardiac arrest should not be coded as yes. So this patient had a cardiac arrest. He was unresponsive, but prior to surgery, he was opening his eyes and following commands. All right, so I got a question. We don't code this patient. All right, 
a question, I'll hurry it up. For patients mm -hmm. who um, have an arrest, who are unresponsive, then they get put on um, medication, propofol or whatever, to keep them sedated. They've never regained consciousness. How are we coding those patients? I think we, we, we wouldn't be able to code them because they're being medically induced. You know, so we don't code it now. I would say, ah, uh, yeah, because this is a this is a patient that's not on medications to keep them unresponsive, yeah. and somebody who does not um, wake up prior to surgery, basic. And and, and the reason we want to capture this is for um, it's important to know how the patient's going into surgery, especially if they don't wake up after surgery, right? So if this person was never awake before surgery, um, you would want to know that. For those patients that and are- I would guess uh, for patients on propofol, they would be doing neural checks on those patients. And I'm assuming- Probably a sedation vacation just to see if they're responsive. Yeah, okay. I would assume they would have to. I mean, that's what they do normally is um, they check these people to see if they, they are responsive. Okay, question number seven. The patient was given one sublingual nitroglycerin tablet for chest pain. He immediately developed a headache and subsequently passed out for about 15 seconds. His blood pressure was 97 over 62 during the episode. His blood pressure right before was 140 over 72. Do I code this as syncope? Yes or no? So he got nitro, got passed out, blood pressure was low. Is this syncope or not? Melinda, I don't know if we're going to be able to get through all your questions. We might have to defer them to another one because we have quite a few. Uh, we have 30, about 30 questions. <laughs> okay. Waiting. Maybe, it's up to you. Maybe we'll stop. Let's see. Maybe we'll we stop a, after syncope. Yeah, we have a staff meeting um, in 15 minutes. Oh. So I don't want to. I mean, we can go over a little bit, but I don't want to go over too much. Okay. Uh, they will stop after this one. Um, so the answer would be no. Um, and the reason the answer is no is because a couple of things here. First of all, when we talk about syncope, we're talking about sudden loss of consciousness, not related to anesthesia and, and believed to be related to a cardiac condition. Okay, this patient, got sublingual nitroglycerin, blood pressure dropped fairly significantly, and his syncope was, was a vasovacal type of syncope or a neurocardiogenic syncope, meaning that this is not the kind of syncope that we want to capture. Because it's clearly in the training manual that we do not capture vasovagal syn syncope. So this is what happened to this patient. Gave him medication, dropped his blood pressure, he passed out. That's a vasovagal syncope. So we wouldn't capture this as syncope. We can, we can stop here and do the rest the next time. Okay, yeah, let's go, if that's okay, let's go through the questions. Okay. We've gotten just so we can get through those, um, if that's okay. Okay, if my patient was transferred to LTAC on ventilator, do I follow patient, the patient for, the, uh, for extubation date and times? Well, first of all, LTAC is not considered another acute care hospital. It's a, considered an acute care rehab. So we don't have to follow those patients when they go to LTAC. Now say that they did go to another hospital intubated. Mm -hmm. What do we use for extubation date and time? The time they're extubated at the other hospital. Because if they're going to another acute care hospital, you have to follow them until discharge from that hospital. Yeah, for patients who are discharged to LTACs, which are long-term facilities, we use the discharge date and time, right? Right. Okay, thank you. How, oh, Schwen is saying uh, porcelain A aura is no place to document that. Yeah, we, we don't capture that field anymore. Yeah, it was a low frequency. Actually, we just looked at that. <laughs> the other day. Yeah, it was less than 2% in the database. Um, can you, oh, here, this is where that, this is the question that started, no, you, just the ABI. You can't, you, you can't use ABI numbers to code PAD. You have, you can look at those ABI numbers 
And then you can look for documentation of PAD. And if you think that that patient may have PAD based on those ABI numbers, but you don't see any documentation to support that, then you need to clarify with the provider. The data managers are not expected to interpret diagnostic results and make diagnosis based on it. Thanks, Melinda. When does the when does the provider documentation come into play for PAD? It has to be provided to document to code it. You mm -hmm. have to have provider documentation to code it, Molly. Yeah. Um, if you had a CT of the head previous infarct, I thought we code for a stroke. And these are but these are different fields with different definitions, Kelly. So when you look at the cerebral vascular definition, yes, you can if you see a head CT that says previous infarct and it's been read that way by the reader of that CT scan, then yes, you can code that as a stroke. But PAD has different rules. That's why it's important to look at the field that you're abstracting to make um, sure that you're abstracting it correctly. For question three, does PAD diagnosis by provider have to be present to code PAD? Yes. Yes. Why is claudication acceptable but a 60% on CT not? Because claud claudication is um, a diagnosis by a provider and it is associated with the diagnosis of PAD and it's in the definition that that is one of the, the ways we can code PAD. This has come up before at our facility during Tabri Bell and CT imaging. Discovered PVD, but no documented history. The structural heart coordinator has started to include the PVD findings when she documents a multidisciplinary team review that includes surgeon and cardiology. Would that count as documentation? I think it depends on how she's documenting it, Joanne. I mean, if she's saying the patient has P PAD, then that's one thing I, I, I would need to see. And it also has to be scanned and into the chart, right? So yeah, and I don't, yeah, so I don't know how this is being documented. That's, that's the key here. If she's documenting, okay, this patient has a 60% um, stenosis and this is PAD, then yeah, that, that's acceptable. Yeah. Wouldn't documentation of 60% stenosis in the report by the radiologist who reads the CT scan count as documentation? No, they no, Charlotte, they have to say PAD in their interpretation or in their impression statement of that report. They have to make that connection for you. Um, we're not asking data managers to make that connection. It has to be clearly documented that there's PAD. Um, same thing, ASHRAF, for the 80% iliac stenosis without diagnosis. These are the types of things where if you see this uh, documentation, 80% iliac stenosis, and there's no diagnosis anywhere, PAD, PVD, you have to talk to the providers and get them to document it for you. It's all part of making sure your documentation meets uh, the requirements for coding so you can abstract all of the risk factors associated with your patients. This is where people leave money on the table in risk adjustment. And uh, you, when I get questions about, well, why am I not getting three stars or you know, things like that? Not that this is the sole thing behind it, but oftentimes it's because we leave risk factors unsaid or undocumented and unabstracted. So if we don't get those risk factors abstracted, you can't get credit for them on the um, expected side of the uh, observed to expected ratios for star rating calculations. So it's really important to work with providers, especially when you see things like this. I would not just walk away from this and say, oh, well, if that wasn't documented, I'm not gonna code it. I would reach out to my provider and say, hey, I saw you documented this. Um, does the patient have a PVD or PAD? If so, will you please document it? so we can abstract it um, for STS or so, so that it's in the chart and the patient that can be part of the patient's diagnoses that are billed for that patient too. So, um, all right, Melinda, sorry, I got off my, on my soapbox. Right. Can Thank an email you. from a provider be enough to code PAD? 
I think if it's a clarification email and it's in the medical record, it certainly can be, or you keep it for an audit or something. I mean, you're, you have to have that documentation if you have an audit. Um, um, Laura's saying, but on the other hand, there's an MD uh, physician who documents PAD. There's nothing in the chart to hold that up. Sometimes you only see carotid disease and they document PAD. Right. If it's carotid disease and PAD, we talked about that. Um, if it's just PAD, it's PAD. Um, you know, um, I, I get questions like that sometimes and I'm like, well, you know, if you're, if you're unsure and you're questioning whether this patient actually has this, then clarify with your provider. Um, a lot of times it, they, they do document PAD as, as carotid disease. And so that's a big one just to look for because um, we have separate fields for those things in our database. We don't combine it together. So. Thanks. Um, Sherry's saying the manual states a positive test of greater than 50%. And then continue reading. It says, is a possible indicator of PAD? You have to have... Do not interpret those results to be PAD. That's not our job. It's the physician's job to document that, um, to interpret those results. And um, they know the patient. They have to interpret those results for us in, or in order for us to be able to capture them. Um, could you show the slide again on risk factors and audit items that was shown on the first PAD question? Uh, there you go. On the first poll question, you said we should code PAD for subclavian stenosis, but if the provider did not code PAD, we could no, not code that, correct? So they're asking Wrong. if subclavian stenosis had to be coded in addition to coding, or uh, had to be dictated in addition to PAD. Do both Subclav of them have to be there? Subclavian stenosis is part of the definition. So if you have that, you can code PAD. It's all about looking at the definition. Go down to the Slide, slide was that, Carol? Okay, so here's your definition, okay? And it says this can include, so if, if the patient has something that's included on this list, you can code PAD, okay? If there's something else, like we've been talking about stenosis, then the doctor has to say this stenosis basically equals PAD, okay? Um, but yes, if you have one of these documented um, conditions right here that we're looking at, you can code PAD without the doctor saying PAD, because these things have been vetted, they're in the definition, and they're included in the definition of PAD. Okay, thanks, Melinda. Um, now here's the um, reverse of this from Ashraf. What if it says there's a diagnosis of PAD, but it's not supported by any objective testing? Yeah, we just had that question. So um, again, if you're unsure about this diagnosis that the provider has provided, then I would seek clarification. That's what I tell people to do um, because you do have a diagnosis, but if you're unsure about it, if there's something that makes you suspicious of that diagnosis, I would certainly clarify it with the provider. Yeah. Uh, please understand most of our extractors are contractors and do not get to listen to these webinars. They go only by the text in the manual and by giving them a percent of stenosis that makes me, makes me assume we can call it. They can't query a doc either. I think the key here, but I appreciate that comment. I think the key here is that it's a possible indicator of PAD. We can remove this um, statement if you think that would be helpful and just leave it as there has to be documentation of PAD. The point of this though is to say, hey, this is, you know, be aware, look for, if you see this, there's, there may be PAD documented in the chart somewhere. So it's kind of like a key to give you that. But if it's helpful to remove it, you know, we can certainly remove that statement. Um, and, you know, not being able to query the doctor that's doing their cases, um, I think that that's, that's a shame. And I think Melinda feels the same way because it's their data. And, you know. Well, I do know that 
people who work for outside data extraction companies do have liaisons at the facilities that could clarify yeah. questions that they have if if they have that kind of relationship too. So it depends on your data abstraction company that you work with, whether you do that or not. Um, and then Kim saying, um, for the correct, it's a no says question. It's a yes or no question, which leads into the documentation of the percent stenosis. And that's usually when we see um, when we see our data being queried, that's usually what it is, is that they look for the, they're more concerned about the percent stenosis than they are uh, yes or no for this, for this carotid stenosis question. But that's, you know, it's, that's drastically different um, to me than having PAD when we're looking at stroke outcomes and things like that. Um, what if they say plaque noted? You have to you have to clarify what plaque. I mean, does that plaque indicate PAD? Is uh, just to clarify if the HMP is a history or diagnosis of claudication, no other info tests, et cetera, um, is PAD to be coded? You can. It's in the definition that if they have a diagnosis of claudication, you can do that. Patient has a long history of PAD. Again, if you feel like if you, guys are see, if you guys are seeing this and you have any questions about whether the validity of the diagnosis by the provider is true or not, then you need to co uh, collaborate with your provider. Otherwise, take it at face value. This is the question it was related to, Melinda, was the carotid endarterectomy question. They're questioning oh. that it says relatively long history of PAD. I think the part you have to read the whole sentence it says status post left carotid endarterectomy and up above it says provider documents PAD due to carotid disease so yeah. in this whole scenario we're not coding the PAD related to carotid disease or status post left carotid endarterectomy because that's captured in the other carotid field um yeah, that's a good question, Jackie, from Jackie. What if they've been given a sedation vacation, but they don't wake up? And I think we have to look at that one individually and take it to the surgeons to discuss it. Okay. You could send that one in, Jackie. Yeah, that's a good question. If the patient has strokes occurring on admission with CT evidence and has endocarditis, has to have valve surgery, then they do follow up MRI and show some possible new stroke. Is that called a post op stroke? That's one I'll have to look at, Beth. We'll have to, you need to send that in with notes and scans and dates and all that stuff. Okay. Because it, it may just have been an extension or, or it may have been a new one. We, we have to kind of look at that one. Progress note and she also documents which providers were present in the team. I think if it's a progress note in that patient's chart, that's okay, right? It's part of the permanent chart. They can use that for abstraction. I guess I'm not, I'm not yeah, I don't remember what your first question was, Joanna, so I'm sorry. If it you was about the um, structural heart team, the TAVR question, structural heart team. And they do the reviews and she'll um, she'll clarify the diagnosis of PAD during that review. Uh, can documentation of PAD from an APN qualify for the PAD? Yes, that's the provider. Yeah, need, Beth says needs to be part of the permanent chart. And then Erica says, how can a clarification email that is not part of the medical record be considered an abstraction? You should be I, you should be scanning those into your chart if you're using them for abstraction, um, or putting them with your if you do paper data collection forms, putting them with the paper data collection forms to be to be provided to the auditors. Yeah, it has to be provided audited. to the auditors for that field. Um, why can't it just be defined like other vascular stenosis? stenosis? <laughs> that's a good. That's a good point. Maybe we can. Um, maybe this will be a good uh, thing for the upgrade, Carol. Yeah, we can certainly review it. How is other vascular stenosis defined? I 
I don't, I don't know what she's talking. At. Are you talking about carotid stenosis, Beth? Uh, it's, it's different. We have, um, we can use non-invasive testing greater than 50%. Um, we have a, quite a criteria for that. It's fairly long. I, yeah, I think the issue with this was when we were, when we got that question with 2.9, we had ABIs that were different than what the stenosis showed and how do we reconcile those and then trying to come up with the hierarchy. And then we just said, why are we having data managers code this? It's really a physician's job to make the diagnosis off mm -hmm. of the tools that they have, the ABIs and the CT scans or ultrasounds or whatever it is. So that's why we that's why we ended up where we ended up, right? Um, but I'm not sure I'm back uh, per percent by percentages, and that's what why we, that's exactly why we ended up there because it's not just one percentage that the provider uses to make that diagnosis. It's a you know it's a whole range of things that they may use, um, even though it's indicated. You know it may be um, indicative or it might be like it said the training manual says it's a possible indication, we have to have that provider documentation to support that. Um, Gosh, we have so many more. I know you guys have to go. Yeah, we have, um, you did a great job with the description for coronaries. Yeah, it's totally different though for the coronaries, I think. And we, um, you know, we can certainly review that, but that's why we got rid of those numbers because we got a question in 2.9 that had to do with APIs our ABIs had to do with percentages by CT scan. And then we had, um, we have other testing that can be considered for diagnosing uh, PAD. And it was just the hierarchy of it. It did not make sense for data managers to have to try to figure out when it should simply just be charted in the chart if the patient has PAD. Um, the, surgeons, the surgeon, provider, whomever needs to document it. Okay. Yeah, they just said, um, you could finish the statement in the training manual by adding is not a diagnosis of PAD. So maybe we could add that. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't understand. Um, Sherry's saying, just want to clarify, a 60 or 80% stenosis stated in the iliac artery is part of the lower extremity. Is that considered part of the definition like subclavian stenosis? So shouldn't they? No. So you have to have provider documentation of peripheral artery disease for that. Subclavian stenosis is acceptable. Um, yeah, we don't have we don't have a stenosis criteria in the definition of PAD like we do some of the other fields. So that is what's causing, I think, the confusion here. If you look when you look at the training manual, it does not say that you can diagnose PAD based off stenosis in lower extremity vessels or you know. So that, that's hence the problem, so. Yeah, it's saying, so it says, uh, it's not what it says at the beginning of the training manual. I think it's pretty clear documentation from a healthcare provider is required to quote this field. Maybe we need to say documentation of PAD. Maybe, maybe. And I think, you know, you finished this, you must have supporting documentation from the healthcare provider to code PAD, PPD. Maybe we have to say it, uh, maybe we have to add that back and just keep reiterating it. And I think, you know, it's, here's a good example. For example, a CT, and this has been in the training manual since we went live, a CT angiogram shows 80% stenosis in the iliac artery, but there's no documentation from the patient's healthcare provider to clarify that it is PAD. Clarification and document, 
documentation from the provider is needed to abstract PAD. If you do not have that documentation, you have to get it. you have to get that documentation um, and have your provider documented in their notes. And I don't definition indicate um, whether the patient has a history of PAD includes upper and lower extremity, renal, mesenteric, abdominal. And then but we that, I say that you have to have documentation of PAD to code that. Okay, so I think what you guys are confusing, let's go back up to the definition, just this, Carol. It says, Sorry. indicate whether the patient has a history of peripheral arterial disease. And then it tells you it can be in the upper, lower extremity, renal, mesenteric, abdominal aortic. It does not say anything about a stenosis that is proving that the patient has PAD. It's saying, does the patient have a history of PAD in these specific areas? Okay, so it's not like carotid disease where we can look at a scan and show and if it's greater than 50% in the carotids, we can say, yes, they have carotid disease. It's not like that. This definition is different. We don't have a stenosis that's, that's a level that says this is PAD. That's, that's the difference here. Yeah, I and I think, that. you know, the reason why, Melinda, it's a good point. This is the areas that it can occur in, right? Because you could have other vascular disease that isn't, or arterial disease that is not in the peripherals, right? But we can right. talk about, right. you know, coronary artery disease. That's mm -hmm. not peripheral. We could talk right. about um, your head vessels, right? That's not peripheral. We could talk right. about your aorta. I don't think that's peripheral unless we get into the thoracic or abdominal aorta then that is considered peripheral. So right. if we're talking about the areas that this is. There was a lot of confusion in previous versions about coding any type of um, aortic stenosis in this field. This is not a field to capture thoracic aortic stenosis. We capture abdominal aortic stenosis here. So this is where, this is a clarification about the, um, the anatomic, anatomical structures where PAD or PVD is um, is considered to have, that's where it, you know, where it lives. If, if you're gonna have PVD, it's going to be in one of these areas. It's not going to include your coronary system. It's not gonna include your thoracic aorta, et cetera. This is just the definition of what we're capturing here, laying out the areas that we're capturing it. When we get down into the intent clarification, it's very specific to what you're capturing, how you're capturing, what the requirements are to code this field. And that's why we have the intent clarification section, and that's why we have you know updates that get added in here. Um, I, I can try to make this clear in the training manual. But I don't know how much clear we can get when we say the provider is uh, documentation from provider is needed to abstract PAD. Documentation from a healthcare provider is required to code this field. Oh, Beth's saying bold it. Yeah, or maybe I need to say document a diagnosis of PAD from the health provider. I mean, just, I don't know, maybe just make it clear somehow. You brought up some good points. Yeah, we don't, so the definitions, um, they usually don't change between versions. This yeah. is the definition for that field saying where it's, you know, what the field is capturing. It's capturing peripheral artery disease within this section. The, they don't usually, we cannot change the definition um, after the version goes live. That's just the way the versions are built. And the, we're not changing the definition. The intent clarification is meant to support the definition and provide exact details. On, on what to collect, how to collect it, when to, you know, when to collect it, what's needed to code it, et cetera. So, it's a little, yeah, this one's a little hard. Yeah, and Suzanne has a good comment. She says, I think you should say in the training manual that provider documentation is required 
for PAD unless the following conditions are documented, claudication, amputation, et cetera, then provider documentation of PAD is not necessary. Oh, that's good. I like that. I'm going to copy that right now. <laughs> and then, send, I'm sending that to myself. Yeah, um, and then um, the other one was when we code as a no, would we code for a known for PAD if there isn't supporting documentation by the physician? I don't know what that means. Is that, does that mean that if you see a stenosis, but you don't have documentation, you, you code unknown? Yeah, I would code unknown if I saw a stenosis, but I couldn't have any clarification. Yeah, I would really try my hardest to get that clarified. But, but if I didn't see any, any indication of PAD at all, I would just code no. I don't know which question you're asking about, but those are the two scenarios I can think of. Okay. And then um, I, and I don't mean to keep on telling you, t telling everybody, no, these are really great ideas. There's a few things we can't change when version goes, goes live. Um, the short name is a field that lives throughout the data, the versions of the database. The only time we ever change a short name is if there's a major definitional change and we require the, we retire the field and either get rid of it altogether or have a major definitional change that the field drastically changes and it doesn't map, it, it won't, it, it won't map the field essentially ends and we start a new field with a new definition. Um, so the short name does not change. We can't change the short name. The things that we can change are the long names. And that's this used to be called peripheral vascular disease. We changed the long name to peripheral artery disease, just so that would be a little bit more clear that we're collecting uh, both there. Well, yeah, and that's another good point because I get questions about that all the time. Surgeons are documenting peripheral vascular disease instead of arterial disease. And when you see peripheral vascular disease documented, you can't assume that that's arterial because sometimes it's not. It's clearly vascular disease. So um, I had a question just like that. That was yesterday. Yeah. Um, so maybe I just need some, we need some work on this definition a little bit or this intent maybe to help clear it up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we, we should do that. I mean, we tried, we knew we couldn't change it. We didn't want to lose the data. We don't want to lose 2.9 data when we go to look across versions on this risk factor. So we kept the short name and kept the field the same and tried to make clarifications in the attempt, but maybe it just didn't work. So we can revisit it when we have an upgrade, which is not planned at that time. Yeah, Brian says only ask because PVD is often used for venous disease and PAD is quite specific for arterial disease. All right. And we are only capturing arterial disease in this field. Hmm. All right, I think we have to go. I'm 15 minutes late to a staff meeting. I wish we could um, finish this. We, maybe we can revisit it again on an upcoming webinar, Melinda. Maybe in yeah. January. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for staying on. Thanks, Catherine. Um, thanks, thanks everybody, everybody for staying on with us and thanks. we'll work on this section. We'll revisit it again and see if we can do a better job with it. Uh, have a great rest of the day and talk to you soon. Thank you.